Today's topic is rigor and relevance. So the issue is on a sort of very overall level, what should be the aim of business schools? What should be the aim of business research? That's what Vermeulen's text is about. And we'll also add to this uh, the text by Smith on, on practically significant versus just statistically significant to add sort of a further lay on that. And in the live session, we will work with some exam oriented questions and talk more generally about the exam as well. That's the agenda for this second half of lesson 13. First, I'll try to outline what sort of is at stake and the issue here. And this book very nicely illustrates the challenge. Very famous book, as you can see, three million copies sold, uh, New York Times bestselling um, book, uh, trying to identify why some companies make the leap and others don't. So what does, what makes a firm great? So not just a good firm, but what constitutes greatness in firms? This is what Jim Collins said that he set out to study. Right? Really, really important question. I mean, we all want to know what ca what characterizes great firms, and apparently this book tells us. So let's dive into it. So what did he do? His team of authors, 21-person um, research teams, a quite big team, they sifted through 1,435 companies and then identified a list of 11 firms that seemed to have made the leap in terms of the performance. Um, so for instance, they look at higher stock returns. Did they outperform other firms in the industry where they're well-established and still on an upward trend 15 years later? That was some of the criteria they used. And, and, and using those criteria, they ended up with these 11 companies. And you might know some of these, but I'm not sure you know all of these companies here. Um, so after identifying these 11 firms, Collins then tried to see, well, what, what made them different? went out and interviewed um, a bunch of people at these companies. But if we then look at, and this is a, a point made in 2006 on this, uh, this blog post I'm citing here, these 11 firms that were identified in 2001 have actually since 2001 and on, until 2006 performed similarly to the rest of the Fortune 500 firms in the United States. So firms that were identified as being the sort of the recipe for greatness, these are, this is what the great firms do. Well. In fact, after you've identified them, dear Collins, they actually turn out just to perform, on average, the same level as others. On a, their average uh, position was, was 202 on this Fortune 500 list. And, and very crudely put, and the, 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 the simple mistake they make here, the two fatal errors they make in, in the book is that they data mine, so they look at all these 1,435 companies in order to find 11 that stand out. And of course, there are companies that's gonna stand out. That's what a distribution is always going to look like. There are some companies that are going to be at the end of the distribution. And then they think because they right now are performing the best, it's sort of a causal effect. It's because they causally do something different that, that propels them to the to the top. But it's really just fundamentally flawed research design. Um, again, you will always, if you look at 1,435, you'll always find 11 companies that perform the best. It's like sort of going out and, and looking at the championship winners in some kind of sports and then go out and ask them why they won. I mean, it might sort of be interesting to look at what they used to do well, but it doesn't mean that they're still doing the right things. Um, and, and, and the point here and what Vermeulen text is then also dealing with is that it's not useful to make these big practical claims about what organizations in practice should pay attention to if they're not based on proper rigorous methods. So again, the mistake is that at if you look at any kind of list of any kind of companies and individuals, et cetera, there are some that are gonna perform better than others, but just because they, at some point in time or for some period of time, perform the best does not mean that they will continue to perform better in the future. Um, they're not, you're not necessarily, you're not necessarily, the, or the reason that sort of led them to be at the peak in 2001 are not necessarily enduring reasons that are gonna continue to sort of demonstrate their greatness, which in fact, it, they did not. Um, and again, you could sort of do the same study again today, look at the, out of the 1500 sort of top companies today, who has performed the best in the last 15 years? There are 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 or however many companies that are gonna perform better than others. That's just the way that a, a distribution works. So Vermeulen's topic here, and the topic we're dealing with today here is that Sure, we want to say something that is meaningful, for instance, about what constitutes greatness and what, what makes a great firm, but we want to do it based on a rigorous scientific method that can ensure some kind of validity. Maybe not a permanent truth, as Ashrant would say, 
but at least some kind of temporal truth, right? It's, it's been something that business schools and universities uh, have been struggling with for, for decades since they were invented. What should be the primary aim of a business school? Theory or practice? What, what are we sort of going for here? Um, and, and, and sort of originally the idea was should really be sort of driven by, 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 by chemistry or physics and purely science driven or should it be more like a trade school and really focused on a hands-on practice that we can use tomorrow. Or a bit like medicine that is both very science driven but of course also can help people, uh, patients immediately. Um, and historically, I mean originally, and here we sort of talking about maybe 50s, 60s, 70s, business schools were sort of more like trade schools and professors were sort of telling anecdotes, war stories, and, and maybe some practical points and claims. But it was not science driven, it was not empirically driven, whether statistical methods or qualitative methods. Currently, I think it's fair to say that the main aim of a business school is more towards the science part. Um, there are many business school professors who don't directly interact with businesses or individuals um, or the economy more, more generally because they sort of do the research either in a lab or just sitting at the desk going through archival research. And, and this is still something that business schools are struggling with. What should be the aim? And again, one could make the medicine comparison where medical schools both do sort of advanced biological research, but many of the people that are professors at the medical uh, department here, for instance, all universities, they are actually also practicing doctors. Um, so what what should we do? Um, if we look at the way that business schools and universities are ranked, you might sometimes hear about all universities being in the top 100 or top 125 of various kinds of ranking systems. If you um, if you look at these, I mean, they're actually usually mainly defined by academic sort of theory-oriented stuff. For instance, academic reputation, what does academic think is the best university? How often researchers are cited in scientific research? Age index is also about publishing. It's not too important what it is. There is an employer reputation in there. There is a practice angle in there. But still, generally, when we look at sort of the quality of a given university or business school, it is actually mainly the theory side that we've looked at. One could also sort of look at what journals define as sort of a good contribution to, for instance, Academy of Management Journal, where we read one of the AMJ and we've read uh, a couple of things in there. Um, and, and, and I've just inserted some screenshots that, in, that, that show the development over time. Originally, it was actually a search for truth, whatever sort of truth meant, but that was in the 50s, 60s. Then it was focused on contribution to industrial societies in the 70s. Then it was theory focused. And, and nowadays, um, it's, it's trying to do both. It's trying to say you should both have a theory and practice focus. But I think it's interesting to see that this is something in not just business schools, but also the sort of academic journals in the field have struggled with what should actually be the core thing that we do. And the way that it's been phrased right now, it's almost as if it's sort of either one thing or the other. Either you really talk to practice or you're very theory and science driven. While the Mullen's point is that we can do both at once. Um, it can be rigorous and sciencey, and it can be relevant for practitioners at once. Um, and then, but but this is sort of the issue that, that that he's dealing with here. That there are quite a few papers published in management or economics journals that are not directly applicable by any business or any government. Um, it's great to be very very precise, but sometimes we just have to be say something that is important for the real world. This statement here is very, very precise, but it's not going to help anyone. This one is actually going to be much more helpful. Again, we'll get to in just a second. The Mullen's argument is that you can do both. But but, but it is, um, this is what he's sort of arguing against, that as if there is a distinction here. Let me try to explain what I mean with these concepts. So rigorous research means that it's just concerned about methodological rigor. It follows standard data collection and analysis methods. Um, it's just that it's good science sort of very crudely and, and simply put um, solid theory and solid methods etc so this is what we mean with rigorous uh, it's been based on a solid approach whether we talk about research designs methods or validity concepts and sort of the position that he's arguing against is the idea that these are opposing concepts so there are some in the field that are arguing, well, you can't do both at once. So if you want to talk to practitioners 
while it's about relevance and then you're sort of pulling the rigor out of it. Um, while Vermeulen is then arguing that you can bridge these. He's saying there is no trade-off between trying to do rigorous business administration research and being relevant to, um, to the business practitioners. And he's actually saying research that is not rigorous, rigorous cannot be relevant. And that, I'll, I'll expand on this in just a second, but this is really the, the key thing. Research that is not rigorous simply cannot be relevant. So, so Vermeulen is saying, look, we need to rethink this. We need to make clear that it's not either going for rigor or going for relevance. Good business administration research is doing both at once. Um, so what is then relevance? Before I define uh, rigor, but what is then relevance? So he's not saying that relevance is some kind of immediate prescription. So relevance is not just saying, look, dear practitioner, manager in a company, whatever, this is what you have to do tomorrow. It's, it's sort of a more general thing. It's about generating insight that practitioners find useful for understanding their own organizations and situations better than before. So it's not necessarily do this tomorrow. Here is a list of seven items that an entrepreneur should think about in order to be successful. It's sort of more generic kind of general, general reflection kind of, of, of thing that Generating insights practitioners find useful for understanding their own situation. It's also the, the quote here by a famous uh, social scientist and, and, and business administration scientist, March, is, is also saying is that, I mean, we're not, researchers in this field are not supposed to sort of fix, it's not like going out and, and, and like a plumber and, and fixing a problem here and now. We don't find solution to business problems. That, he doesn't think that his job as a Stanford uh, professor at a business school but he can sort of provide insight about sort of provide general insight about uh, situations that a, a manager can then use and apply in a specific situation. Um, so again, it's about we just want I just really want to highlight this relevance is not defined as being able to tell a manager this is exactly what you have to do in this particular situation, but it's sort of more general and useful insight and. And then the point is here, one can also sort of explain what relevance then means by trying to explain well, what would not be relevant insights. So if we already know something that is sort of very established to be true, well, it would be not that relevant for a manager. Um, let's say we do research on very old data sets from, I don't know, find a data set from the 80s and talk about information systems in the 80s. It might not really be relevant for time today. Maybe it would depends on the external validity of this, but it might not um, be that relevant for today. We will probably prefer a data set that is a bit newer. Um, let's say that we find out that better weather leads to better man management. I mean, that, that's sort of difficult maybe for a manager really to take advantage of. Maybe she should move the firm to a, a country with more sun, but, but it, it's sort of re usually outside management control. Um, we also saw this example in the complexity video about it. Now I've done a study where I've omitted a bunch of real life factors. Well, that might also be less relevant to managers because managers can rule out these real life factors that they are in the complex world and they have to, to, to balance. So this is just to sort of give some crude indications of that you can do rigorous research, but it's just not clearly relevant for managers. And, and, and if we then consider, well, what is both rigorous and relevant? It's highlighted here on page 79 to 979 to 980 in the Vermeulen text uh, that you also can access here. I'm going to get to the key quotes here in just a second, but it's really useful to at least have a good grasp of those uh, pages in order to be sure to understand what's going on here. So here we have um, sort of some of the essence here that Vermeulen is saying. It is the research question that was asked in the first place that determines the usefulness of the study findings. So it's not the study findings that determines the usefulness according to Vermeulen, but whether it was a relevant question in the first hand. Um, so if a study lacks relevance or practical meaning, it's because of the question was sort of the wrong one. So again, he's saying here, relevance is found in the question that is being asked by a given piece of research, rigor in the method applied to answer the question. Um, and he's again trying, based on an example, make the same point over here, that we 
need to engage in rigorous research because that is sort of the basis for anything to even be relevant and whether anything is relevant is based on the research question that is asked. So research question that was asked in the first place determines the usefulness of the study's finding um, and so often something lacks practical meaning because the question was meaningless, so lack of relevance. But it's very important to very important to emphasize that yes you might ask a very relevant question in your research but if you don't which is what the the Collins book of from good to great did what characterizes a great firm but if you don't engage in a rigorous method in order to answer the question well then the relevance just crumbles and there is nothing left so it's not enough to have asked a relevant question according to Tim Newton you also need to engage in a rigorous method to answer this question but again it's important to note that he's not saying that we should judge the relevance of a given study by how interesting the answer is. You can ask a really interesting question and find out that either it's difficult to answer or there are different answers depending on the context or whatever it could be. It could still be relevant for a manager to know that this is sort of an area where science doesn't have a clear answer because then the manager can know, okay, it's difficult to make an evidence-based decision, but then I need to, to base whatever I do based on this particular context. So it's not about sort of coming up with answers that can change practice as much as possible. It's about asking questions about things that are really important for managers. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of follow up on this explanation of the essence of Vermeulen texts of rigor and relevance in the live session by providing a few examples using Dan O'Reilly and Bernstein, et cetera, as uh, examples of papers that we then can try to assess was this both rigorous and relevant.